It's not lost on us that you have taken time on a Sunday morning uh, to tune in and to be a part of our worship and, and joining us in, in worshiping him. And uh, we just know that God is so good. Uh, and he's going to speak to you today if you open your heart to him. And uh, we know uh, beyond the shadow of a doubt that uh, God is behind us and with us and for us and opening up doors and, and so many things. And uh, so we're excited. I do want to just remind you that um, starting next Sunday, March the 7th, uh, we're open for business again. There will be a time for us to invite you into our service. We're going to be going uh, to, uh, well, we are live right now, but I mean, uh, next week we will have more of you in the sanctuary. Just a reminder, you do need to register, and so uh, there will be an email that will go out from the office this week uh, to make sure you register. Uh, we have to keep ourselves within a certain amount of people within the building, uh, still with COVID uh, restrictions, but we're so glad that we can gather uh, like this. So uh, pay attention to that and uh, make sure you register by noon on Thursday, okay? And so that's going to be very, very important. And then, of course, when you get here, um, make sure that you do all the COVID protocol. It's old hat for us now, isn't it? But uh, make sure you wear a mask, uh, that you sanitize properly, and that, of course, we keep our social distance. That's very difficult for us in the church uh, to, uh, to do that, admittedly. But um, we do ask that you would do that. We don't want anybody to get sick. And uh, we want to be responsible that way. Wow, what a time of worship we had today. And I'm just going to, right off the bat, I'm going to invite uh, God. I'm going to invite the Holy Spirit uh, to speak to us in these moments. Father, it is with great joy that we can open up your word of God. I remember years ago, Lord, a, uh, a pastor uh, in the uh, Bible school that I went to used to very, very adamantly and uh, uh, charismatically hold up the word of God. And he would say, the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. And that is our heart today, Lord. That is our desire. We want to lift up your name as we look at your word. We know that it is uh, uh, the word that will not return void. That as we open it up and we allow you to teach us, Holy Spirit, through the word of God, that our lives will be transformed for the better. And so I would ask that you would anoint this message, not for my sake, but for those who need to hear what you are saying to them today. And so we commit ourselves to you in Jesus' name. Amen. So today, if you have your Bibles, I'm going to encourage you to turn to Psalm chapter 1. We're going to get there eventually. Um, at least I, I think we will. But uh, until we get there, I, I want to talk about a very interesting passage of Scripture that reveals the true character of the person it writes about. In Daniel chapter 6, we read this. Then this Daniel distinguished himself above the governors and satraps because an excellent spirit was in him. And the king gave thought to settling him over the whole realm. And so the governors and satraps sought to find some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom. But they could find no charge or fault because he was faithful, nor was there any error or fault found in him. Then these men said, we shall not find any charge against this Daniel unless we find it against him concerning the law of his God. In verse 3, in this passage, Daniel, God reveals to us the best way to distinguish yourself above others is to allow an excellent spirit to be in us. Now, what? is an excellent spirit. How do you get that? What does that look like? And how do I incorporate those things in our lives? Well, we just read about Daniel, and the Bible says that he had an excellent spirit in him. But the, he wasn't the only one 
in the Old Testament that talked about that way. Um, we think about Joseph in the Old Testament and how he had a very excellent spirit within him as well. In the Word of God, consider this. Nothing negative is ever written about Joseph or Daniel. Joseph, too, was promoted to the king's court. Joseph, too, stood alone for what was right. Daniel was thrown into a lion's den. Joseph was thrown into a pit by his jealous brothers. And later he was thrown into prison. Daniel interpreted dreams. Joseph also interpreted dreams. But here's the thing that I love about both of these guys. When they interpreted those dreams, neither Daniel or Joseph changed those interpretations to save himself. They were men of God. They exhibited godly character qualities and they never backed down and they never compromised. Now, here's another thought about these two men. Consider this. As readers of the book of Daniel and of also of Joseph's life in Genesis, we have an advantage that these two men didn't have. We know how the story turns out. Daniel did not know when he was thrown into the lion's den whether he would survive the night. He didn't know if he would survive the next moment. Joseph, when he was thrown into prison, didn't know if he would ever see the light of day again. But he was faithful and he stayed true to who he was. That's what it means to have an excellent spirit within you. Now, um, we have in, in our, uh, the last few weeks been doing what we call our clean series. And in that, we've just been able to take a look at the inside because we know that God works from the inside out with us. And we've been just taking a little bit of a, a view, looking inside our hearts and our lives and in our, in our everyday business, the way we do things, and allowing God to examine, examining our attitudes, our, our language, our thoughts, our fears, all of these things in light of the scripture, and allowing God to, to build within us a, a sure foundation. And so today is number seven in that series. It's the last one in this series, and I'm calling it Clean the Goal of the Godly. Now, in the very first chapter and the first three verses of the book of Psalms, we are given a template of what it means to be a godly man or woman. Now, don't you just love that about God? God says, listen, I want you to be holy as I am holy. I want you to live a godly life. I want you to live with, with principles and foundations that you won't compromise, that you'll be strong. So go ahead and do that. But isn't it just like God to say, but I'm also going to show you how to do that. I'm going to give you a foundation from the word of God that you can look to again and again. When you, when you forget how this thing goes together, how life works. You can go back to the owner's manual and look it up and say, oh yeah, that's right. These are the things that I need to have in, my pla in place in my life. And so we're going to take a look at this psalm and develop those, um, that template in these next few moments. So let's read that first. Psalm 1, 1 to 3. Uh, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. Lord, I can't help it. I have to come to prayer. As I read these powerful words, these, these foundational things, I'm asking, Lord, I am asking that your spirit would speak to those who are listening today. We pray against any evil force that would try to distract or to convince that what is being said is not true. But that, Lord, 
people who are listening today would be able to receive this right where they're at as a foundation, as, as things to mark down in their books so that they can look to it again and again and again. And so I just ask that you would just remove the wood, the hay, the stubble, anything in this message that is not from you. And we pray and we speak in the power of the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So quickly this morning, it gives us a characterization of what a godly man or woman looks like. And so let's start right off in verse 1. The first thing the first foundational thing we know, if you're going to have a goal of the godly, it is this. This person orders his life around godly counsel. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. This person is a person who's also memorized Proverbs 4.14 where it says, Do not do as the wicked do and don't follow the path of evildoers. This is a person who follows the Lord with their whole being, a person who wants to seek the advice of godly people in their lives, people who, are, who have studied the word of God and allowed the principles of the word of God and are demonstrated in their lives. Those are the people that you go to and say, I need some direction. I need some help in my life. Would you give me some things? I need help with my marriage. I need help with my, my wayward children. I need help help with my work situation. I need help with my health. All of these things. I need help with my finances. You name it. You go to the godly counsel of those who love the Lord their God. I think back in my life. I have been blessed beyond measure with people who I deeply respect. Many of my peers in the, in the EMCC pastors who I have looked up to, uh, regional ministers and district superintendents and presidents in the past. I have others who have I've sought counsel and advice when we were planting a church and, and uh, just talked to them. I talked to one man. He's probably listening to this morning because he has been over the last little while. Um, and I asked him, I said, listen, how, how do you go about your baptisms when you don't have a baptism tank? And he gave me some sound advice on how to best use that and bring glory to God. These are things that we just happen. I think of Mr. and Mrs. Robbins. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Robbins, Mr. Robbins was the founder of New Brunswick Bible Institute back in the uh, 50s and uh, a very godly man. And when I went out to MBBI, um, MBBI was out in the, in the country, and they had their campus and everything, and about a quarter mile away was the, the farm that the uh, Bible school owned, and it was a dairy operation, and of course, I was a a uh, farm kid going to Bible school. They found out that really quickly. And uh, so I was put on the, the barn crew or the, the milk crew. And uh, we would get up very early, usually about 4.30 in the morning, we would make our way over to do the milking uh, on, on, the, uh, on the farm before we got back for our classes. And we always had to be very careful when we took the, the truck from the campus over to the barn because along the road, almost, it didn't matter if it was stormy, it didn't matter if it was rainy, it didn't matter if it was snowing, it didn't matter what it was. Mr. Robbins, the founder of the school, an older man at this point, an old man, guy from out west, he was the, he was the type of uh, teacher, professor, who taught in a three-piece suit with a Stetson and cowboy boots. Loved him. And here's this guy, this old man, who would be walking along the road, having his time with the Lord. Do you know, I can hardly remember uh, anything that the man taught in his classes. I'm sure if I looked back, I could find it. What I remember about him was his walk with Jesus. He loved it. He loved his time with the Lord every day. He was up before the, the dawn and spent time with that. And then his wife, what a godly woman. What a, what a wonderful, meek, kind, godly woman. She was one of our professors too. And she used to sign all of her notes to us as students with this, glad that I'm his. I love that. Are you glad that you're his? I am. In fact, if you see a lot of letters that I write to you now, I borrowed that from Mrs. Robbins. I just, it's so impacted my life. Glad that I'm his. So seeking the counsel of people who live it 
and talk it and and our part of it is so incredible. So that's the first foundation. The second foundation for a person who's pursuing godliness, to have their goal as the godly, um, is this, that this person seeks friends with fellow believers, not with the lost. Because it says in the second part of Psalm 1-1, nor stands in the path of sinners. Now, this does not mean that we do not have friendships with unsaved people. I mean, that happens. We know that God has placed you into their lives to be able to introduce them to Jesus Christ. That is a, that is a foundation of, of, our, of our existence. We need to continue to go into all the world and, and present the gospel. So it doesn't mean that you don't have unsaved friends. But it does mean that that person who's pursuing godliness, their closest friends are Christians. Their closest friends are the people who will feed into their lives the things of God. They will have a, a godly dis, dis, mis, <laughs> uh, demeanor and a, a tender consciousness toward others. This is your fellow Bethelites here. These are people who you can go to and say, I need prayer. I need time to, I, I'm going through something and someone will walk that journey with you. That person who seeks fellowship with fellow believers is a person on the path to developing godly life. The third thing that we learn in this psalm is that the godly person gets enjoyment and encouragement and refreshment from the word of God. It says, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And may I say this too? That not only do they get enjoyment, encouragement, and refreshment, they also get direction. Did you know that the Bible is the living word of God? Have you ever wondered why we call it the living word of God? Why, why not just the word of God? Why not just the Bible? Well, I'll tell you why. It's the living word of God because within its pages, the Holy Spirit dwells. And he opens up our eyes and our minds to be able to understand the things of the Spirit of God. If, if, we could, if the Holy Spirit didn't teach us, we wouldn't be able to understand. And so we also know it is the living word of God. Not that it's past tense. It is current. It is always present tense. You have something going on in your life that you need direction for. You can go to the word of God and it is current. The advice it will give you will apply to your situation. I promise you this. And so we have the, the living word of God. And we can seek direction on this. I, I want to brag a little bit, if I might, just for a moment. Uh, Bethel, you have um, some of the most godly leaders as elders in this church than I've ever met in my life. And I'll tell you why. This past week, we had a, a time of, uh, we had to make some decisions. When are we going to open up? What are we going to do? What's it going to look like? What's the summer going to look like? What are all the big, big, heavy things that are coming on us and decisions that we have to be made? And you know what they asked? They asked that they could have the, the schedule given to them ahead of time so that they could seek God in prayer and ask God for a word from his word as to what we should do. Like, who does that? except people who love God more than anything else. And they delight in his word and they believe that he will give them the answer for their lives. Listen, a person who gets enjoyment from and refreshment from the word of God loves the Bible more than they love television. They love their Bible more than their hobbies or their magazines. They, they meditate day and night on God's law. Now, meditating, let me talk about that for just a moment. Meditating is really just nine on what was just said. Meditation asks certain questions as the Bible is read. Questions like, what did I, what, with what I just read, what did that just tell me about God? What did that just tell me about Jesus? What did that just tell me about myself? What is it that I need to hand over to him? God, what are you saying to me through your word? And meditating happens when you take the time to stop and ask those questions. And may I, while I'm at it, 
encourage you to journal those things. If you're anything like me, I can't remember half the stuff. I can't remember what I said five minutes ago, right? That's my excuse for a lot of things, by the way. But anyway, when you journey, journal, you record these things. And do you know, I, I've been journaling for many years now, and I've had the opportunity, uh, just to, took the opportunity a few days ago, just to go back some of, over some of those early journals uh, way back in 2011, 2012, and, and, and just read the things that I was saying to the Lord and what he was saying to us and the things I was asking for of God at that time and how he, over time, looking back, I see how he answered those things. Listen, take the time to write those things down. Listen, um, as Charles Stanley puts it, he says, meditation is simply this, absorbing the truth into our very being. Absorbing the truth into our very being, just allowing it to permeate every pore in our bodies, listening to God as he speaks to us in his word. When Joshua was overwhelmed with his new responsibilities of leading Israel, God gave him this counsel in Joshua 1.8, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. The person who just occasionally glances at the Bible, tries to see if there's some kind of truth, a wee nugget that they could just hang on to for a moment, never fully understands that what they are doing. Listen, how do you live the Christian life? How do you live according to God's word and God's, God's will if you don't understand the word of God, if you never spend time in it? You can't do it. And so that's why you get Christian philosophies that have nothing to do with the word of God. You have Christians out there promoting certain things, believing certain things that the world and the culture says is okay, and they think, well, that sounds like a good idea. But they have never studied the Word of God. They never know it. Let me take one issue, and I take issue with this. And I know I'm probably going to get my wrist slapped and, and things, and my wife is cringing right now, because she, but she knows me. Listen, some time ago, um, our government passed a law uh, called Medical Assistance in Dying. And, and they, they promote it as being a kind and, and, and just being compassionate for the person. If you're getting to the end of your life and you just don't see any value in it anymore and you're so much pain, why don't you just have the choice to do this? And then you have Christians all over the place clapping and applauding and saying, yes, this is a good thing. And yet the heart of God is broken because God has said in his word, I am the giver and taker of life. I am the one who chooses when you live and when you die. But we don't know that. We don't read the word of God. We don't really care. We, we, we assume God is going to uh, agree with us. We develop our worldly philosophies and then we try to sanctify them. And God says it doesn't work that way. And we need to hold to the truth. The person who says, I'm going to choose to take my own life is not the person, as the Bible says, who has let God be the God of their life. They are making the choices. They are deciding what's best for them instead of seeking God and going to him and seeing what he says about the situation. Joshua said, that this book of the law will not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night so that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. Okay, fourthly, the godly person will successfully stand the storms of life. He shall be like a tree, verse 3 says, planted by the rivers of water. A tree planted by the rivers of water. A godly person can stand the storms and tests of life because they are firmly rooted. They have a taproot that goes right down to Jesus Christ. Listen, Psalm 37, 23 and 24 says, The Lord directs the steps of the godly. He delights in every detail of their lives. Though they stumble, they shall never fall, for the Lord upholds them by the hand. Listen, my mother, I, I love my mother. 
And uh, she just, she passed into God's presence um, back in the fall. And uh, she was a, a lady who had suffered much in her life. She had grown up in the dirty 30s in Europe and then uh, experienced the, the time of uh, the Second World War as uh, Europe was in, in such turmoil, living in Holland at the time and uh, experiencing occupation and what that all looked like and then eventually uh, emigrating with her family to Canada and uh, getting married and, and having things. But my mom had a lot of things. She had a lot of loss in her life. She lost her, my brother when he was 20 years old in a farm in a in a, um, a, a motor vehicle accident, and then uh, my my dad and her husband uh, was killed in a farm accident, and then she lost a grandchild in a, in another accident. She had a lot of things, but my mom, to the very end, was a faithful woman in her love for God. Why? Because her taproot went right to Jesus Christ. And he is the one who sustained her even through all the pain and all the frustration and all the other things that were going on, even in the end, when her mind was, was completely muddled up with dementia. She was a woman in the depths of her being who was at peace because of who the Lord Jesus Christ was to her. So what's the fifth thing that we want to talk about today? A godly person is a fruitful person. That brings forth its fruit in its season, verse 3 says, whose leaf also shall not wither. Listen, to be a fruitful for Christ means that you must learn to be patient. You see, fruit only ripens in its season, and you can't hurry it along. God is simply asking you to be faithful to what he has called you to be, and to do, and the fruit of that faithfulness will come out in his time. That's important. I want to say that again because, and mark this down because it's really important. God is simply asking you to be faithful to what he has called you to be and to do, and the fruit of that faithfulness will come out in his time. Many years ago, there was an American evangelist by the name of Mordecai Ham who preached faithfully all over the country. One night, a teenage boy named Bill came forward and got saved. Now, Bill had wanted to become a professional baseball player, but that night, his plans were radically changed. And for the next 75 years, Billy Graham carried out the torch that left faithfulness uh, left by the faithfulness of Mordecai Ham. And he carried the gospel message around the world, including preaching behind the Iron Curtain. And if you're younger here today and you're listening, ask your parents what I'm talking about when I say the Iron Curtain. But he was behind the Iron Curtain of communism. And he also spoke in predominantly Muslim countries. God opened the door. God made a way when there seemed to be no way. Why? Because an old evangelist, Mordecai Ham, on nights when maybe nobody hardly ever showed up, one night a young man named Bill got saved and God took a hold of him. And for 75 years preached the gospel of Jesus Christ to presidents, to kings, to queens, to dictators. And God was good. I want to tell you another story. This is a little more current, a little more modern. But some years ago now, a simple, unassuming little man faithfully stood on a university campus in the state of Oklahoma and handed out Gideon New Testament. Hour after hour, he st stood there offering a Bible to any student who wanted one. And he faced ridicule and he was mocked. And he, but he remained. Eventually, one student came and took one of those Bibles. God used that Bible to transform and save Craig Groeschel, who today is the lead pastor of Life Church. Life Church today has over 26,000 members and 36 campuses around the world. But here's the part that's most exciting for me. Life Church developed 
the YouVersion Bible app, which today has had over 250 million downloads on phones and tablets all over the world. This app is completely free. There's no charge for it. You know, some years ago, Life Church staff tracked down that little old man of the Gideon Bible Society and brought him to go see Pastor Craig, who was able in tears to be able to say, thank you, thank you for your faithfulness. You see, we don't always know. We don't always know. But the fruit of our faithfulness, God uses and presents. Little did this man know that his faithful, humble obedience would mean not only everything to Pastor Groeschel, but to literally millions of others around the world today in 2021. And so we know this. Number six, a godly person prospers in all he does. And whatever he does shall prosper, it says in verse three. He prospers in his home, in his work, in his relationships. Now, this does not necessarily mean that this person will be wealthy, which is the way that the world defines it. There's so much more to life than money. I really think this verse is talking about the fact that this person flourishes in everything he does. When you have that foundation of God in your heart and in your life, everything becomes, gets in order and gets its proper place, and we, have a, we gain the proper perspective. And then number seven, a godly person is content. Have you ever been around a content person? <laughs> it's, it's quite a noticeable thing, isn't it? The Bible says that the godly man exhibits a sense of calm, and he isn't anxious. In Philippians 4, 6, and 7, it says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all that he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and your minds as you live in Christ Jesus. So Jesus Christ is in charge of all of the life of the godly person. That person knows that Christ's grace is sufficient for whatever comes their way. And they know that because they trust God for all things, that he equips them for all that they need to do his will. We know that God produces in that person, through the power of Jesus Christ, every good thing that is pleasing to him. Now, friends, listen to me. The beginning of godliness starts with Jesus Christ. You cannot be godly from the, starting from the outside in. God has to do that transforming work in your heart first. And that starts by asking him to come into your heart and into your life. That, that starts with that invitation to allow the God of the universe to come and dwell within you. And the Bible says that when you do that, when you ask him to do that, he comes and he dwells with us. And the Holy Spirit lives within us and he begins to shape us and, and to transform us into the image of God's son. That's where it starts. Listen. Our homes need more godly people. Our churches need more godly people. And our world desperately needs godly people. So Psalm 1 defines this person. Do you know a godly person? Are you one? It starts today. Now, just by way of wrap-up, I'm going to conclude the series of clean. Let's talk about just very quickly about the last seven weeks, what we've talked about. We've cleaned our thought life. We started with that. We cleaned our language and our speech. We cleaned our need for possessions. We cleaned our minds of fury and anger. We cleaned our lives of radioactive relationships. We cleaned our minds of the spirit of fear. And today, we have filled our hearts with the pursuit of godliness. I'd say we've done a good job at spring cleaning, haven't you? And so today, why don't we open up the windows of our hearts and allow the sunshine of the spring that's soon to be upon us 
but allow the sunshine of God's love to radiate your life and cleanse you from the inside out. I'm going to invite the team to lead us in a closing song, after which I will come up and we will do a benediction. Thank you.